prologue the revolutionary force today has two targets, moral as well as material. Its young protagonists are one moment reminiscent of the idealistic early Christians, yet they also urge violence and cry, burn the system down. They have no illusions about the system, but plenty of illusions about the way to change our world. It is to this point that I have written this book. These words are written in desperation, partly because it is what they do and will do that will give meaning to what I and the radicals of my generation have done with our lives. They are now the vanguard, and they had to start almost from scratch. Few of us survived the Joe McCarthy Holocaust of the early 1950s and of those there were even fewer whose understanding and insights had developed beyond the dialectical materialism of orthodox Marxism. My fellow radicals, who were supposed to pass on the torch of experience and insights to a new genera prologue just were not there. As the young looked at the society around them, it was all, in their words, materialistic, decadent bourgeois in its values, bankrupt and violent. Is it any wonder that they rejected us in toto? Today's generation is desperately trying to make some sense out of their lives and out of the world. Most of them are products of the middle class. They have rejected their materialistic backgrounds, the goal of a well-paid job, suburban home automobile, country club membership, first-class travel, status security, and everything that meant success to their parents. They have had it. They watched it lead their parents to tranquilizers. Alcohol, long-term endurance marriages, or divorces, high blood pressure, ulcers frustration, and the disillusionment of the good life. They have seen the almost unbelievable idiocy of our political leadership in the past political leaders, ranging from the mayors to governors, to the White House, were regarded with respect and almost reverence. Today they are viewed with contempt. This negativism now extends to all institutions, from the police and the courts to the system itself. We are living in a world of mass media, which daily exposes society's innate hypocrisy, its contradictions and the apparent failure of almost every facet of our social and political life. The young have seen their activist, participatory democracy turn into its antithesis, nihilistic bombing and murder. The political panaces of the past, such as the revolutions in Russia and China, have become the same old stuff under a different name. The search for freedom does not seem to have any road or destination. The young are inundated with a barrage of information and facts so overwhelming that the world has come to seem an utter bedlam, which has them spinning in a frenzy, looking for what man has always prologue xv. Looked for from the beginning of time, a way of life that has some meaning or sense. A way of life means a certain degree of order, where things have some relationship and can be pieced together into a system that at least provides some clues to what life is about. Men have always yearned for and sought direction by setting up religions, inventing political philosophies, creating scientific systems like Newton's or formulating ideologies of various kinds. This is what is behind the common cliché, getting it all together. Despite the realization that all values and factors are relative fluid and changing, and that it will be possible to get it all together, only relatively, the elements will shift and move together just like the changing pattern in a turning kaleidoscope. In the past the world, whether in its physical or intellectual terms, was much smaller, simpler, and more orderly. It inspired credibility. Today everything is so complex as to be incomprehensible. What sense does it make for men to walk on the moon while other men are waiting on welfare lines or in Vietnam killing and dying for a corrupt dictatorship in the name of freedom? These are the days when man has his hands on the sublime while he is up to his hips in the muck of madness. The establishment in many ways is as suicidal as some of the far left except that they are infinitely more destructive than the far left can ever be. The outcome of the hopelessness and despair is morbidity. There is a feeling of death hanging over the nation. Today's generation faces all this and says I don't want to spend my life the way my family and their friends have. I want to do something to create, to be me, to do my own thing to live. The older generation doesn't understand and worse doesn't want to. I don't want to be just a prologue's v piece of data to be fed into a computer or a statistic in a public opinion poll, just a voter carrying a credit card. To the young the world seems insane and falling apart. On the other side is the older generation, whose members are no less confused. 
If they are not as vocal or conscious, it may be because they can escape to a past when the world was simpler. They can still cling to the old values in the simple hope that everything will work out somehow, some way. That the younger generation will straighten out with the passing of time. Unable to come to grips with the world as it is, they retreat in any confrontation with the younger generation with that infuriating cliché, when you get older you'll understand. One wonders at their reaction if some youngster were to reply, when you get younger what? Will never be then you'll understand, so of course you'll never understand. Those of the older generation who claim a desire to understand say, when I talk to my kids or their friends I'll say to them, look I believe what you have to tell me is important and I respect it. You call me a square and say that TM, not with it, or I don't know where it's at, or I don't know where the scene is and all of the rest of the words you use. Well I'm going to agree with you. So suppose you tell me, what do you want? What do you mean when you say I want to do my thing? What the hell is your thing? You say you want a better world. Like what? And don't tell me a world of peace and love and all the rest of that stuff because people are people, as you will find out when you get older. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say anything about when you get older. I really do respect what you have to say. Now why don't you answer me? Do you know what you want? Do you know what you're talking about? Why can't we get together? Prologues V and that is what we call the generation gap. What the present generation wants is what all generations have always wanted a meaning, a sense of what the world and life are a chance to strive for some sort of order. If the young were now writing our declaration of independence they would begin when, in the course of inhuman events, and their bill of particulars would range from Vietnam to our black Chicano and Puerto Rican ghettos to the migrant workers to Appalachia to the hate, ignorance, disease, and starvation in the world. Such a bill of particulars would emphasize the absurdity of human affairs and the forlornness and emptiness, the fearful loneliness that comes from not knowing if there is any meaning to our lives. When they talk of values, they are asking for a reason. They are searching for an answer, at least for a time, to man's greatest question, why am I here? The young react to their chaotic world in different ways. Some panic and run, rationalizing that the system is going to collapse any way of its own rot and corruption and so they're copping out, going hippie or yippie, taking drugs, trying communes, anything to escape. Others went for pointless sure loser confrontations, so that they could fortify their rationalization and say well, we tried and did our part and then they copped out too. Others sick with guilt and not knowing where to turn or what to do went berserk. These were the weathermen, and their like. They took the grand cop-out suicide. To these I have nothing to say or give, but pity, and in some cases contempt, for such as those who leave their dead comrades, and take off for Algeria, or other points. What I have to say in this book, is not the arrogance prologue XVM, of unsolicited advice. It is the experience, and counsel that so many young people, have questioned me about through all night sessions, on hundreds of campuses, in America. It is for those young radicals, who are committed to the fight, committed to life. Remember we are talking about revolution, not revelation. You can miss the target, by shooting too high, as well as too low. First, there are no rules, for revolution any more than there are rules, for love or rules for happiness, but there are rules for radicals, who want to change their world. There are certain central concepts of action, in human politics, that operate regardless of the scene, or the time. To know these is basic to a pragmatic attack on the system. These rules make the difference between being a realistic radical and being a rhetorical one, who uses the tired old words and slogans, calls the police pig, or white fascist racist, or motherfucker, and has so stereotyped himself that others react by saying oh, he's one of those, and then promptly turn off. This failure of many of our younger activists to understand the art of communication has been disastrous. Even the most elementary grasp of the fundamental idea that one communicates within the experience of his audience and gives full respect to the other's values would have ruled out attacks on the American flag. The responsible organizer would have known that it is the establishment that has betrayed the flag, while the flag itself remains the glorious symbol of America's hopes and aspirations, and he would have conveyed this message to his audience. 
On another level of communication, humor is essential, for through humor much is accepted that would have been rejected if presented seriously. This is a sad and lonely generation. It laughs too little, and this, too, is tragic. Prologue 6 for the real radical, doing his thing, is to do the social thing, for and with people. In a world where everything is so interrelated, that one feels helpless to know where or how to grab hold, and act, defeat sets in. For years there have been people, who've found society too overwhelming, and have withdrawn, concentrated on doing their own thing. Generally we have put them into mental hospitals, and diagnosed them as schizophrenics. If the real radical, finds that having long hair sets up psychological barriers to communication and organization, he cuts his hair. If I were organizing in an orthodox Jewish community I would not walk in there eating a ham sandwich unless I wanted to be rejected so I could have an excuse to cop out. My thing, if I want to organize, is solid communication with the people in the community. Lacking communication I am in reality silent. Throughout history silence has been regarded as assent, in this case assent to the system. As an organizer I start from where the world is, as it is, not as I would like it to be. That we accept the world as it is does not in any sense weaken our desire to change it into what we believe it should be it is necessary to begin where the world is if we are going to change it to what we think it should be. That means working in the system. There's another reason for working inside the system. Dostoevsky said that taking a new step is what people fear most. Any revolutionary change must be preceded by a passive, affirmative non-challenging attitude toward change among the mass of our people. They must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that they are willing to let go of the past and chance the future. This acceptance is the reformation essential to any revolution. To bring on this reformation Ray Prologue X requires that the organizer work inside the system among not only the middle class but the 40% of American families more than 70 million people whose incomes range from $5,000 to $10,000 a year. They cannot be dismissed by labeling them blue collar or hard hat. They will not continue to be relatively passive and slightly challenging. If we fail to communicate with them, if we don't encourage them to form alliances with us, they will move to the right. Maybe they will anyway, but let's not let it happen by default. Our youth are impatient with the preliminaries that are essential to purposeful action. Effective organization is thwarted by the desire for instant and dramatic change, or as I have phrased it elsewhere, the demand for revelation rather than revolution. It's the kind of thing we see in playwriting. The first act introduces the characters, and the plot, in the second act, the plot and characters, are developed as the play strives to hold the audience's attention. In the final act good and evil, have their dramatic confrontation and resolution. The present generation, wants to go right into the third act, skipping the first two, in which case there is no play, nothing but confrontation, for confrontation's sake, a flare up and back to darkness. To build a powerful organization, takes time. It is tedious, but that's the way, the game is played, if you want to play, and not just yell, kill the umpire. What is the alternative, to working inside, the system? A mess of rhetorical garbage, about burn the system down. Yippee yells of do it, or, do your thing. What else? Bombs. Sniping. Silence when police are killed, and screams of murdering fascist pigs when others are killed. Attacking and baiting the police, public suicide, power comes out of the barrel of a gun, is an absurd rallying cry, prologues see when the other side has all the guns. Lenin was a pragmatist, when he returned to what was then Petrograd from exile, he said that the Bolsheviks stood for getting power through the ballot, but would reconsider after they got the guns, militant mouthings, spouting quotes from Mao, Castro, and Che Guevara, which are as germane to our highly technological computerized, cybernetic nuclear-powered, mass media society as a stagecoach, on a jet runway, at Kennedy Airport. Let us in the name of radical pragmatism not forget that in our system with all its repressions, we can still speak out, and denounce the administration, attack its policies, work to build an opposition political base. True there is government harassment, but there still is that relative freedom to fight. I can attack my government, try to organize to change it. 
That's more than I can do in Moscow, Peking, or Havana. Remember the reaction of the Red Guard to the Cultural Revolution and the fate of the Chinese college. Students, just a few of the violent episodes of bombings or a courtroom shootout that we have experienced here would have resulted in a sweeping purge and mass executions in Russia, China, or Cuba. Let's keep some perspective. We will start with the system, because there is no other place to start from except political lunacy. It is most important for those of us who want revolutionary change to understand that revolution must be preceded by reformation. To assume that a political revolution can survive without the supporting base of a popular reformation is to ask for the impossible in politics. Men don't like to step abruptly out of the security of familiar experience. They need a bridge to cross from their own experience to a new way. A revolutionary organizer Prologsky must shake up the prevailing patterns of their lives agitate, create disenchantment and discontent with the current values to produce, if not a passion for change, at least a passive, affirmative non-challenging climate. The revolution was effected before the war, commenced John Adams wrote. The revolution was in the hearts and minds of the people, this radical change in the principles, opinions, sentiments and affections of the people, was the real American revolution. A revolution without a prior reformation would collapse, or become a totalitarian tyranny. A reformation means that masses of our people have reached the point of disillusionment with past ways and values. They don't know what will work, but they do know that the prevailing system is self-defeating, frustrating and hopeless. They won't act for change, but won't strongly oppose those who do. The time is then ripe for revolution. Those who for whatever combination of reasons encourage the opposite of reformation become the unwitting allies of the far political right. Parts of the far left have gone so far in the political circle that they are now all but indistinguishable from the extreme right. It reminds me of the days when Hitler, new on the scene, was excused for his actions by humanitarians on the grounds of a paternal rejection and childhood trauma. When there are people who espouse the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy or the Tate murders or the Marin County Courthouse kidnapping and killings or the University of Wisconsin bombing and killing as revolutionary acts then we are dealing with people who are merely hiding psychosis behind a political mask. The masses of people recoil with horror and say, our way is bad, and we were willing to let it change, but certainly not for this murderous madness. No matter prologue how bad things are now, they are better than that. So they begin to turn back. They regress into acceptance of a coming massive repression in the name of law and order. In the midst of the gassing and violence by the Chicago police and National Guard during the 1968 Democratic Convention many students asked me, do you still believe we should try to work inside our system? These were students who had been with Eugene McCarthy in New Hampshire and followed him across the country. Some had been with Robert Kennedy when he was killed in Los Angeles. Many of the tears that were shed in Chicago were not from gas. Mr. Alinsky, we fought in primary after primary and the people voted new backslash Vietnam. Look at that. Convention. They're not paying any attention to the vote. Look at your police and the army. You still want us to work in the system. It hurt me to see the American army withdrawn bayonets advancing on American boys and girls. But the answer I gave the young radicals seemed to me the only realistic one. Do one of three things. 1. Go find a wailing wall and feel sorry for yourselves. 2. Go psycho and start bombing, but this will only swing people to the right. 3. Learn a lesson. Go home, organize build power, and at the next convention, you be the delegates. Remember? Once you organize people around something as commonly agreed upon as pollution, then an organized people is on the move. From there it's a short and natural step to political pollution, to Pentagon pollution. It is not enough just to elect your candidates, you must keep the pressure on. Radicals should keep in mind Franklin D. Roosevelt's response to a reform delegation, okay you've convinced me. Now go on out and bring pressure on me. Action comes from keeping the heat on. Prologues if no politician can sit on a hot issue if you make it hot enough. As for Vietnam, I would like to see our nation be the first in the history of man to publicly say we were wrong. What we did was horrible. 
We got in, and kept getting in deeper and deeper, and at every step we invented new reasons, for staying. We have paid part of the price, in 44,000 dead Americans. There is nothing we can ever do to make it up, to the people of Indochina, or to our own people, but we will try. We believe that our world has come of age, so that it is no longer, a sign of weakness or defeat, to abandon a childish pride, and vanity, to admit we were wrong. Such an admission would shake up the foreign policy concepts, of all nations and open the door, to a new international order. This is our alternative to Vietnam anything, else is the old makeshift patchwork. If this were to happen, Vietnam may even have been somewhat worth it. A final word on our system. The democratic ideal, springs from the ideas of liberty, equality, majority rule through free elections, protection of the rights of minorities, and freedom to subscribe to multiple loyalties, in matters of religion, economics, and politics rather than to a total loyalty, to the state. The spirit of democracy, is the idea of importance and worth, in the individual, and faith in the kind of world, where the individual can achieve, as much of his potential as possible. Great dangers always accompany great opportunities. The possibility of destruction, is always implicit in the act of creation. Thus the greatest enemy of individual freedom, is the individual himself. From the beginning the weakness, as well as the strength of the democratic ideal, has been the people. Prolog XXV people, cannot be free unless they are willing, to sacrifice some of their interests, to guarantee the freedom of others. The price of democracy, is the ongoing pursuit of the common good, by all of the people. 135 years ago Tocqueville asterisk gravely warned, that unless individual citizens, were regularly involved in the action of governing, themselves self-government, would pass from the scene. Citizen participation is the animating spirit and force in a society predicated on voluntarism. We are not here concerned with people who profess the democratic faith but yearn for the dark security of dependency where they can be spared the burden of decisions. Reluctant to grow up or incapable of doing so. They want to remain children and be cared for by others. Those who can should be encouraged to grow. For the others, the fault lies not in the system but in themselves. Here we are desperately concerned, with the vast mass of our people, who thwarted through lack of interest or opportunity, or both do not participate, in the endless ray asterisk it must not be forgotten, that it is especially dangerous to enslave men, in the minor details of life. For my own part, one should be inclined to think freedom less necessary in great things, than in little ones, if it were possible, to be secure of the one, without possessing the other. Subjection in minor affairs breaks out every day, and is felt by the whole community indiscriminately. It does not drive men to resistance, but it crosses them at every turn, till they are led to surrender the exercise of their will. Thus their spirit is gradually broken, and their character enervated. Whereas that obedience, which is exacted on a few important but rare occasions, only exhibits servitude at certain intervals, and throws the burden of it upon a small number of men. It is vain to summon a people, which has been rendered so dependent, on the central power, to choose from time, to time the representatives of that power. This rare and brief exercise of their free choice, however important it may be, will not prevent them from gradually losing, the faculties of thinking, feeling, and acting for themselves, and thus gradually falling, below the level of humanity. Alexis D. Tocqueville, Democracy in America Prologue, SCV Responsibilities of Citizenship and are resigned to lives determined by others. To lose your identity as a citizen of democracy is but a step from losing your identity as a person. People react to this frustration by not acting at all. The separation of the people from the routine daily functions of citizenship is heartbreak in a democracy. It is a grave situation, when a people resign their citizenship, or when a resident of a great city, though he may desire, to take a hand lacks the means to participate. That citizen sinks further into apathy, anonymity, and depersonalization. The result is that he comes to depend on public authority, and a state of civic sclerosis, sets in. From time to time, there have been external enemies, at our gates. There has always been the enemy within, the hidden and malignant inertia, that foreshadows more certain destruction to our life and future than any nuclear warhead. There can be no darker, or more devastating tragedy, than the death of man's faith in himself, and in his power to direct his future. 
I salute the present generation. Hang on to one of your most precious parts of youth, laughter don't lose it as many of you seem to have done, you need it. Together we may find some of what we're looking for laughter, beauty love, and the chance to create. Sololinsky. The purpose the life of man upon earth is a warfare. Job 7 1. What follows is for those who want to change the world from what it is to what they believe it should be. The Prince was written by Machiavelli for the haves on how to hold power. Rules for Radicals is written for the have-nots on how to take it away. In this book we are concerned with how to create mass organizations to seize power and give it to the people. To realize the democratic dream of equality, justice, peace cooperation, equal and full opportunities for education, full and useful employment, health, and the creation of those circumstances in which man can have the chance to live by values that give meaning to life. We are talking about a mass power organization, which will change the world, into a place where all men and women walk erect in the spirit of that credo of the Spanish Civil War, better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. This means revolution. The significant changes in history have been made by revolutions. There are people who say that it is not revolution, but evolution, that brings about change, but evolution is simply the term used by non-participants, to denote a rules, for radicals for a particular sequence of revolutions, as they synthesized into a specific, major social change. In this book one proposed certain general observations, propositions, and concepts of the mechanics of mass movements and the, various stages of the cycle of action, and reaction in revolution. This is not an ideological book, except insofar as argument for change, rather than for the status quo, can be called an ideology. Different people, in different places, in different situations and different times, will construct their own solutions, and symbols of salvation, for those times. This book will not contain any panacea, or dogma. I detest and fear dogma. I know that all revolutions, must have ideologies to spur them on. That in the heat of conflict, these ideologies tend to be smelted into rigid dogmas, claiming exclusive possession of the truth, and the keys to paradise, is tragic. Dogma is the enemy of human freedom. Dogma must be watched for, and apprehended at every turn, and twist of the revolutionary movement. The human spirit glows, from that small inner light of doubt, whether we are right, while those who believe with complete certainty, that they possess the right are dark, inside and darken the world outside, with cruelty pain, and injustice. Those who enshrine the poor or have nots, are as guilty as other dogmatists, and just as dangerous. To diminish the danger that ideology, will deteriorate into dogma, and to protect the free, open questing, and creative mind of man, as well as to allow for change, no ideology should be more specific, than that of America's founding fathers. For the general welfare. Niels Bohr, the great atomic physicist, admirably stated the civilized position, on dogmatism. Every sentence I utter, must be understood not as an affirmation, but as a question. I will argue that man's hopes lie in the acceptance of the great law of change. That a general understanding of the The purpose five principles of change will provide clues for rational action and an awareness of the realistic relationship between means and ends and how each determines the other. I hope that these pages will contribute to the education of the radicals of today and to the conversion of hot emotional impulsive passions that are impotent and frustrating, to actions that will be calculated purposeful and effective. An example of the political insensitivity of many of today's so-called radicals, and the lost opportunities, is found in this account of an episode during the trial of the Chicago 7. Over the weekend some 150 lawyers, from all parts of the country, had gathered in Chicago to picket the federal building, in protest against Judge Hoffman's left bracket arrest of right bracket the four lawyers. This delegation, which was supported by 13 members of the faculty of Harvard Law School, and which included a number of other professors, as well, submitted a brief as friend of the court, which called Judge Hoffman's actions a travesty of justice. Left bracket which right bracket threatens to destroy the confidence of the American people in the entire judicial process. By 10 o'clock the angry lawyers had begun to march around the federal building where they were joined by hundreds of student radicals, several Black Panthers, and a hundred or more blue-helmeted Chicago police. 
Shortly before noon, about 40 of the picketing lawyers carried their signs into the lobby of the federal building, despite the notice posted on the glass wall beside the entrance and signed by Judge Campbell forbidding such demonstrations within the building. Hardly had the lawyers entered however, than Judge Campbell himself descended to the lobby, dressed in his black robes rules, for Radical 6 and accompanied by a marshal, a stenographer, and his court clerk. Surrounded by the angry lawyers, who were themselves encircled, by a ring of police and federal marshals, the judge proceeded to hold court then, and there. He announced that unless the pickets withdrew immediately, he would charge them with contempt. This time, he warned, there could be no question that their contempt would occur in the presence of the court and would thus be subject to summary punishment. No sooner had he made this announcement however, than a voice from the throng shouted fuck you, Campbell. After a moment of tense silence, followed by a cheer from the crowd and a noticeable stiffening among the police, Judge Campbell himself withdrew. Then the lawyers, too, left the lobby and rejoined the pickets on the sidewalk. Jason Epstein, The Great Conspiracy Trial, Random House, 1970. The picketing lawyers threw away a beautiful opportunity to create a nationwide issue. Offhand, there would seem to have been two choices, either of which would have forced the judge's hand and kept the issue going. Some one of the lawyers could have stepped up to the judge after the voice said, Fuck you, Campbell said that the lawyers there did not support personal obscenities, but they were not leaving. Or all the lawyers together could have chorused with one voice, Fuck you, Campbell. They did neither. Instead they let the initiative pass from them to the judge and achieved nothing. Radicals must be resilient, adaptable to shifting political circumstances, and sensitive enough to the process of action and reaction to avoid being trapped by their own tactics and forced to travel a road not of their choosing. In the purpose seven short, radicals must have a degree of control over the flow of events. Here I propose to present an arrangement of certain facts and general concepts of change, a step toward a science of revolution. All societies discourage and penalize ideas and writings that threaten the ruling status quo. It is understandable, therefore, that the literature of a have society is a veritable desert whenever we look for writings on social change. Once the American Revolution was done with, we can find very little besides the right of revolution that is laid down in the Declaration of Independence as a fundamental right. 73 years later Thoreau's brief essay on the duty of civil disobedience followed by Lincoln's reaffirmation of the revolutionary right in 1861. Asterisk there are many phrases extolling the sacredness of revolution, that is, revolutions of the past. Our enthusiasm for the sacred right of revolution is increased and enhanced with the passage of time. The older the revolution, the more it recedes into history, the more sacred it becomes. Except for Thoreau's limited remarks, our society has given us few words of advice, few suggestions of how to fertilize social change. From the haves, on the other hand, there has come an unceasing flood of literature, justifying the status quo. Religious, economic, social, political, and legal tracts endlessly attack all revolutionary ideas and action for change as immoral, fallacious and against God, country, and mother. These literary sedations by the status quo include the threat that since all such movements are unpatriotic, asterisk Lincoln's first inaugural, this country, with its institutions, belongs to the people who inhabit it. Whenever they shall grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it or their revolutionary right to dismember or overthrow it. Rules for radicals eight subversive, spawned in hell and reptilian, in their creeping insidiousness, dire punishments will be meted out to their supporters. All great revolutions, including Christianity, the various reformations, democracy, capitalism, and socialism, have suffered these epithets in the times of their birth. To the status quo concerned about its public image, revolution is the only force which has no image, but instead casts a dark, ominous shadow of things to come. The have-nots of the world, swept up in their present upheavals, and desperately seeking revolutionary writings, can find such literature only from the communists, both red and yellow. Here they can read about tactics, maneuvers, strategy and principles of action, in the making of revolutions. 
Since in this literature all ideas are embedded in the language of communism, revolution appears synonymous with communism. Asterisk, when in the throes of their revolutionary fervor, the have nots hungrily turn to us. In their first steps, from starvation to subsistence, we respond with a bewildering, unbelievable and meaningless conglomeration of abstractions, about freedom, morality, equality, and the danger of intellectual enslavement, by communistic ideology. This is accompanied by charitable handouts dressed up in ribbons of moral principle, and asterisk you. S. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, the U.S. and Revolution Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions Occasional Paper No. 116. On trips to Asia I often asked men in their 30s and 40s what they were reading when they were 18. They visually answered Karl Marx, and when I asked them why they replied, we were under colonial rule, seeking a way out. We wanted our independence. To get it we had to make revolution. The only books on revolution were published by the communists. These men almost invariably had repudiated communism as a political cult, retaining however, a tinge of socialism. As I talked with them, I came to realize the great opportunities we missed when we became preoccupied in fighting communism with bombs and with dollars, rather than with ideas of revolution, of freedom, of justice. The purpose 9 freedom, with the price tag of unqualified political loyalty to us. With the coming of the revolutions, in Russia and China, we suddenly underwent a moral conversion, and became concerned for the welfare of our brothers, all over the world. Revolution by the have-nots has a way of inducing a moral revelation among the haves. Revolution by the have-nots also induces a paranoid fear. Now therefore, we find every corrupt and repressive government the world around saying to us, give us money, and soldiers or there will be a revolution and the new leaders will be your enemies. Fearful of revolution and identifying ourselves as the status quo, we have permitted the communists to assume by default the revolutionary halo of justice for the have-nots. We then compound this mistake by assuming that the status quo everywhere must be defended and buttressed against revolution. Today revolution has become synonymous with communism while capitalism is synonymous with status quo. Occasionally we will accept a revolution, if it is guaranteed to be on our side, and then only when we realize that the revolution is inevitable. We abhor revolutions. We have permitted a suicidal situation to unfold wherein revolution and communism have become one. These pages are committed to splitting this political atom, separating this exclusive identification of communism with revolution. If it were possible for the have-nots of the world to recognize and accept the idea that revolution did not inevitably mean hate and war, cold or hot, from the United States that alone would be a great revolution in world politics and the future of man. This is a major reason for my attempt to provide a revolutionary handbook not cast in a communist or capitalist mold, but as a manual for the have-nots of the world, regardless of the color of their skin's rules, for radicals 10 or their politics. My aim here is to suggest how to organize for power, how to get it, and to use it. I will argue that the failure to use power for a more equitable distribution of the means of life for all people signals the end of the revolution and the start of the counter-revolution. Revolution has always advanced with an ideological spear just as the status quo has inscribed its ideology upon its shield. All of life is partisan. There is no dispassionate objectivity. The revolutionary ideology is not confined to a specific limited formula. It is a series of general principles, rooted in Lincoln's May 19, 1856 statement, Be not deceived. Revolutions do not go backward. The ideologue why of change, this raises the question, What if any, is my ideology? What kind of ideology, if any, can an organizer have, who is working in, and for a free society? The prerequisite for an ideology, is possession of a basic truth. For example, a Marxist begins with his prime truth that all evils are caused by the exploitation of the proletariat by the capitalists. From this, he logically proceeds to the revolution to end capitalism, then into the third stage of reorganization, into a new social order, or the dictatorship of the proletariat, and finally the last stage, the political paradise of communism. The Christians also begin with their prime truth, 
The divinity of Christ and the tripartite nature of God, out of these prime truths, flow a step-by-step -step ideology. An organizer working in, and for an open society, is in an ideological dilemma. To begin with, he does not have a fixed the purpose. One one truth truth to him is relative and changing. Everything to him is relative and changing. He is a political relativist. He accepts the late justice, learned hand's statement that the mark of a free man is that ever gnawing inner uncertainty as to whether or not he is right. The consequence is that he is ever on the hunt for the causes of man's plight and the general propositions that help to make some sense out of man's irrational world. He must constantly examine life, including his own, to get some idea of what it is all about, and he must challenge and test his own findings. Irreverence, essential to questioning, is a requisite. Curiosity becomes compulsive. His most frequent word is why asterisk. Does this then mean that the organizer in a free society for a free society is rudderless? No, I believe that he has a far better sense of direction and compass than the closed society organizer with his rigid political ideology. First, the free society organizer is loose, resilient, fluid, and on the move in a society which is itself in a state of constant change. To the extent that he is free from the shackles of dogma, he can respond to the realities of the widely different situations our society presents. In the end he has one conviction, a belief that if people have the power to act in the long run, they will most of the time reach the right decisions. The alternative to this would be rule by the elite either a dictatorship or some form of a political aristocracy. I am not concerned if this faith in people is regarded as a prime truth and therefore a contradiction of what I have already written, for life is a story of contradictions. Believing in people, the radical has the job of organizing them so that they will have the power and opportunity to best asterisk. Some say it's no coincidence that the question mark is an inverted plow, breaking up the hard soil of old beliefs and preparing for the new growth. Rules for Radicals 12 meet each unforeseeable future crisis as they move ahead in their eternal search for those values of equality, justice, freedom, peace, a deep concern for the preciousness of human life and all those rights and values propounded by Judeo-Christianity and the democratic political tradition. Democracy is not an end, but the best means toward achieving these values. This is my credo for which I live and if need be die. The basic requirement for the understanding of the politics of change is to recognize the world as it is. We must work with it on its terms if we are to change it to the kind of world we would like it to be. We must first see the world as it is and not as we would like it to be. We must see the world as all political realists have in terms of what men do and not what they ought to do as Machiavelli and others have put it. It is painful to accept fully the simple fact that one begins from where one is, that one must break free of the web of illusions one spins about life. Most of us view the world not as it is but as we would like it to be. The preferred world can be seen any evening on television in the succession of programs where the good always wins, that is, until the late evening newscast when suddenly we are plunged into the world as it is. Political realists see the world as it is. An arena of power politics, moved primarily by perceived immediate self-interests, where morality is rhetorical rationale for exp. Asterisk with some exceptions. In one of America's Shangri-Las of escape, from the world as it is, Carmel by the Sea, California, on the coast of the beautiful Monterey Peninsula, radio station KRML, used to broadcast the Sunshine News, which headlines the positive, only the good news of the world. Intellectuals, who would scoff at Sunshine News, are no exception to the preference for already formulated answers, the purpose 13 deemed action, and self-interest. Two examples would be the priest who wants to be a bishop and bootlicks and politics his way up, justifying it with the rationale, after I get to be bishop I'll use my office for Christian reformation, or the businessman who reasons, first I'll make my million. And after that I'll go for the real things in life. Unfortunately one changes in many ways on the road to the bishopric or the first million, and then one says I'll wait until I'm a cardinal and then I can be more effective or I can do a lot more after I get two million. And so it goes dot asterisk in this world. Laws are written for the lofty aim of the common good and then acted out in life on the basis of the common greed. 
In this world irrationality clings to man like his shadow, so that the right things are done for the wrong reasons. Afterwards, we dredge up the right reasons for justification. It is a world not of angels, but of angles, where men speak of moral principles, but act on power principles. A world where we are always moral, and our enemies always immoral. A world where reconciliation means that, when one side gets the power, and the other side gets reconciled to it then we have reconciliation. A world of religious institutions that have, in the main, come to support and justify the status quo asterisk each year. For a number of years, the activists in the graduating class from a major Catholic seminary near Chicago would visit me for a day just before their ordination with questions about values, revolutionary tactics, and such. Once at the end of such a day, one of the seminarians said, Mr. Olinsky, before we came here we met and agreed that there was one question we particularly wanted to put to you. We're going to be ordained, and then we'll be assigned to different parishes, as assistants to, frankly stuffy, reactionary old pastors. They will disapprove of a lot of what you, and we believe in, and we will be put into a killing routine. Our question is... How do we keep our faith in true Christian values, everything we hope to do to change the system? That was easy. I answered when you go out that door, just make your own personal decision about whether you want to be a bishop or a priest and everything else will follow. Rules for Radicals 14 So that today, organized religion is materially solvent and spiritually bankrupt. We live with a Judeo-Christian ethic that has not only accommodated itself to, but justified slavery, war, and every other ugly human exploitation of whichever status quo happened to prevail. We live in a world where good is a value dependent on whether we want it. In the world as it is, the solution of each problem inevitably creates a new one. In the world as it is there, there are no permanent happy or sad endings. Such endings belong to the world of fantasy, the world as we would like it to be, the world of children's fairy tales, where they lived happily ever after. In the world as it is, the stream of events surges endlessly onward with death as the only terminus. One never reaches the horizon. It is always just beyond, ever beckoning onward. It is the pursuit of life itself. This is the world as it is. This is where you start. It is not a world of peace and beauty and dispassionate rationality, but as Henry James once wrote life is, in fact, a battle. Evil is insolent and strong. Beauty enchanting but rare. Goodness very up to be weak. Folly very up to be defiant. Wickedness to carry the day. Imbeciles to be in. Great places, people of sense, in small, and mankind generally unhappy. But the world as it stands is no narrow illusion, no phantasm, no evil dream of the night. We wake up to it, again forever, and ever. And we can neither forget it, nor deny it, nor dispense with it. Henry James's statement is an affirmation of that of Job. The life of man upon earth is a warfare. Disraeli put it succinctly. Political life must be taken, as you find it. Once we have moved into the world, as it is then we begin to shed fallacy, after fallacy. The prime illusion we must rid ourselves of is the conventional view in which things are seen separate from their inevitable counterparts. The purpose 15 we know intellectually that everything is functionally interrelated, but in our operations we segment and isolate all values and issues. Everything about us must be seen as the indivisible partner of its converse, light and darkness, good and evil, life and death. From the moment we are born we begin to die. Happiness and misery are inseparable. So are peace and war. The threat of destruction from nuclear energy conversely carries the opportunity of peace and plenty, and so with every component of this universe, all is paired in this enormous Noah's Ark of life. Life seems to lack rhyme, or reason or even a shadow of order, unless we approach it with the key of converses. Seeing everything in its duality, we begin to get some dim clues to direction and what it's all about. It is in these contradictions, and their incessant interacting tensions, that creativity begins. As we begin to accept the concept of contradictions we see every problem or issue in its whole, interrelated sense. We then recognize that for every positive, there is a negative, and that there is nothing positive without its concomitant negative, nor any political paradise without its negative side. Niels Bohr pointed out that the appearance of contradictions was a signal that the experiment was on the right track. 
There is not much hope, if we have only one difficulty, but when we have two, we can match them off against each other. Or call this complementarity, asterisk for more than 4,000 years, the Chinese have been familiar, with the principle of complementarity in their philosophical life. They believe that from the illimitable nature, God or gods, came the principle of creation, which they called the great extreme, and from the great extreme, came the two principles or dual powers, yang and yin, out of which, came everything else. Yang and yin have been defined, as positive and negative, light and darkness, male and female, or numerous other examples of opposites or converses. Rules for Radical 16 meaning, that the interplay of seemingly conflicting forces, or opposites is the actual harmony of nature. White had similarly observed, in formal logic, a contradiction is the signal of a defeat. But in the evolution of real knowledge, it marks the first step, in progress towards a victory. Everywhere you look all change shows this complementarity. In Chicago the people of Upton Sinclair's jungle, then the worst slum in America, crushed by starvation wages, when they worked, demoralized, diseased, living in rotting shacks, were organized. Their banners proclaimed equality, for all races, job security, and a decent life for all. With their power they fought and won. Today, as part of the middle class, they are also part of our racist, discriminatory culture. The Tennessee Valley Authority was one of the prize jewels in the Democratic crown. Visitors came from every part of the world to see, admire, and study this physical and social achievement of a free society. Today it is the scourge of the Cumberland Mountains, strip mining for coal and wreaking havoc on the countryside. The CIO was the militant champion of America's workers. In its ranks, directly and indirectly, were all of America's radicals. They fought the corporate structure of the nation, and won. Today merged with the AF. Avell, it is an entrenched member of the establishment, and its leader supports the war in Vietnam. Another example is today's high-rise public housing projects. Originally conceived, and carried through as major advances, in ridding cities of slums, they involved the tearing down of rotting, rat-infested tenements, and the erection of modern apartment buildings. They were acclaimed, as America's refusal to permit its people, to live in the dirty shambles of the slums. It is common knowledge, that they have turned into jungles of horror, and now confront us with the problem of, how we can either convert or get rid of the purpose 17. Them. They have become compounds of double segregation, on the basis of both economy, and race, and a danger for anyone, compelled to live in these projects. A beautiful positive dream, has grown into a negative nightmare. It is the universal tale of revolution and reaction. It is the constant struggle, between the positive and its converse negative, which includes the reversal of roles, so that the positive of today, is the negative of tomorrow and vice versa. This view of nature, recognizes that reality is dual. The principles of quantum mechanics, in physics apply even more dramatically to the mechanics of mass movements. This is true not only in complementarity, but in the repudiation of the hitherto universal concept of causality, whereby matter and physics were understood, in terms of cause and effect, where for every effect there had to be a cause, and one always produced the other. In quantum mechanics, causality was largely replaced by probability. An electron or atom, did not have to do anything specific in response, to a particular force. There was just a set of probabilities that it would react in this or that way. This is fundamental in the observations and propositions, which follow. At no time in any discussion, or analysis of mass movements, tactics, or any other phase of the problem, can it be said that if this is done then that will result. The most we can hope to achieve is an understanding of the probabilities consequent to certain actions. This grasp of the duality of all phenomena is vital, in our understanding of politics. It frees one from the myth, that one approach is positive, and another negative. There is no such thing, in life, one man's positive, is another man's negative. The description of any procedure, as positive, or negative, is the mark of a political illiterate. Once the nature of revolution, is understood from the dualistic outlook, we lose our mono view of a revolution, and rules for radicals 18, see it coupled with its inevitable counter-revolution. Once we accept and learn to anticipate the inevitable counter-revolution, we may then alter the historical pattern of revolution and counter-revolution, from the traditional slow advance of two steps forward, and one step backward to minimizing the latter. 
Each element with its positive and converse sides is fused to other related elements in an endless series of everything so that the converse of revolution on one side is counter-revolution and on the other side, reformation and so on in an endless chain of connected converses, class distinctions, the trinity the setting for the drama of change has never varied. Mankind has been and is divided into three parts, the haves, the have-nots, and the have-a-little, want mores. On top are the haves with power, money, food security, and luxury. They suffocate in their surpluses, while the have-nots starve. Numerically the haves have always been the fewest. The haves want to keep things as they are and are opposed to change. Thermopolitically they are cold and determined to freeze the status quo. On the bottom are the world's have-nots, on the world scene they are by far the greatest in numbers. They are chained together by the common misery of poverty, rotten housing, disease ignorance, political impotence, and despair. When they are employed their jobs pay the least and they are deprived in all areas basic to human growth. Caged by color, physical or political, they are barred from an opportunity to represent themselves in the politics of the purpose 19 life, the haves want to keep. The have-nots want to get. Thermopolitically they are a mass of cold ashes, of resignation and fatalism, but inside there are glowing embers of hope, which can be fanned by the building of means of obtaining power. Once the fever begins the flame will follow. They have nowhere to go but up. They hate the establishment of the haves, with its arrogant opulence, its police, its courts, and its churches. Justice, morality, law, and order are Mere words when used by the haves, which justify and secure their status quo. The power of the have-nots rests only with their numbers. It has been said that the haves, living under the nightmare of possible threats to their possessions, are always faced with the question of when do we sleep. While the perennial question of the have-nots is when do we eat. The cry of the have-nots has never been give us your hearts, but always get off our backs. They ask not for love, but for breathing space. Between the haves and have-nots are the have-a-little, want more is the middle class, torn between upholding the status quo to protect the little they have, yet wanting change so they can get more, they become split personalities. They could be described as social, economic, and political schizodes. Generally they seek the safe way, where they can profit by change, and yet not risk losing the little they have. They insist on a minimum of three aces, before playing a hand, in the poker game of revolution. Thermopolitically they are tepid and rooted in inertia. Today in Western society, and particularly in the United States they comprise the majority of our population. Yet in the conflicting interests and contradictions within the have a little, want more is the genesis of creativity. Out of this class have come, with few exceptions, the great world leaders of change of the past centuries. Rules for Radicals 20 Moses, Paul of Tarsus, Martin Luther Robespierre, Georges Danton, Samuel Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, Napoleon Bonaparte, Giuseppe Garibaldi, Nikolai Lenin, Mahatma Gandhi, Fidel Castro, Mao Tse Tung, and others. Just as the clash of interests within the have a little, want mores has bred so many of the great leaders, it has also spawned a particular breed's tale mated by cross interests into inaction. These do nothings profess a commitment to social change for ideals of justice, equality, and opportunity, and then abstain from and discourage all effective action for change. They are known by their brand, I agree with your end.